it's working. All right, here we go. Now, there is a poster on the wall uh, in my office. We have a communal kitchen space, and uh, on, this, on this wall you can pin up some, some news articles, you can pin up you know, some certificates or things that just get people thinking. And at the moment on this wall, I've seen it a few times over the last few weeks, is this poster here. Now this poster encourages a 90 second pause. We won't pause for 90 seconds now, but it encourages that a 90 second pause can be the difference between a poor reaction when you get triggered by something and a good outcome. Just 90 seconds. 90 seconds apparently is what we need to, to check our emotions, let that kind of initial chemical rush pass by, we're all familiar with that, and to make sure then, you know, I see wives nudging husbands at this moment, <laughs> making sure that our actions align with our values and that we don't go and do or say something that we later regret or wish we had handled slightly differently. Now, I can think back to more than a few situations where a good 90 second pause would have done me, done me good. But it did get me thinking as I was preparing for this preach this, about an idea. And this idea is that as Christians, as, as Christ followers, there is a need sometimes for us to, to pause, to check ourselves before engaging in a situation, before giving our opinion, before providing a response. And this could be any number of situations, just life, just life. From small situations like you know, relational, family uh, issues that we occasionally have, uh, through to big global events that feel like we need to be involved with. And I think even over the last like, one or two years, the, the kind of events in my life that have vied for my time and attention and something of a response. Uh, think about the political landscape, for example, at the moment. All right? We've just had elections, and if you want to be an engaged citizen, you would have voted. And that is not so easy, is it? You want to be engaged, be like, who do I vote for? And what values do they hold? And you know, what about this, what about that? And then there's all the discussions and debates around that. It's like, well, how are they gonna fund tax cuts now? And you know, what about the Treaty of Waitangi in the place? It's like all these situations that vie for our attention. Or what about global events? We are exposed all over the world to different events, um, you know, from, from earthquakes and humanitarian crises to wars whether it be the war in Ukraine or the Israel-Palestine conflict, just things that like, man, we see these things and we just want to do something, don't we? We want to share an opinion, we want to get involved, we want to give, we want to do something. That's kind of at a big level. What about at an everyday micro level? What about relationships and friendships and dealing with those situations? What about, what about raising children, you know? What about helping your child navigate uh, playground dramas? and helping them to work through situations. What about finances? What about interest rate hikes? And pressure on budget. I was just reading even this week, you know, um, they reckon that about 20,000 mortgages in New Zealand uh, are late in their payments. They're expecting that number to increase. It's up about 25%. Um, interest, uh, um, insurance premiums for your house, for some are up 40 to 50% in the last 12 months on top of all the already growing Cost. I mean, these things have direct impact on us. There are situations that we face. Now, what I'm saying is that there's no end to situations, large and small, that require us to pause before we engage. A bit of a rugby metaphor. You know when it's like crouch? It used to just be like crouch, pause, huh! Now it's like crouch, pause, think about the weather, check the guy beside you, huh, huh, and engage. Like, but it's like we need to take that time as Christians, don't we? Isn't it so easy to rush into a situation only later to reflect, hmm, maybe the Jesus way would have been a little bit different, you know? Thinking about, for example, one uh, situation we could probably all relate to, um, James and John, you know? They want to murder an entire village because they offend Jesus, you know? That kind of situation. You kind of, you know, relevant situation like that. I kind of imagine Jesus like, I think you guys need to see this poster here. <laughs> he did call them the sons of thunder. I imagine what they would have been like to be around. But we need to pause and, and take stock, don't we? Does my approach, does my behavior, does our uh, strategy, behavior align with Christ's way and with his, with his kingdom? 
And I want to talk about the kingdom today because that really is, is key to what we're talking about. You see, I love Mark's gospel. You know, I'm a big fan, Mark's gospel. Yeah. Now, in Mark's gospel, Jesus bursts onto a very highly charged environment. And you notice in Mark's gospel, everything happens in a rush. It's always immediately, it's now, it's next, it's suddenly. Kind of relevant for us in a busy modern world. But Jesus bursts onto the scene as his character, and everyone's like, hey, Jesus, what's your take? What about the Romans? Should we pay taxes? What about the Samaritans? What do you reckon, Jesus? But you see, before Jesus' followers could gain insight into Jesus' position on any of these issues or engage in them himself, they needed to grasp his central message, his central focus, which was, hey, the kingdom of God has arrived. The kingdom of God has, has arrived. Therefore, my followers, says Jesus, time to take 90 seconds, time to repent, time to change the way that you think and realign how you're going to approach this situation with the kingdom of God. And so that's something of my encouragement today, to take a bit of a 90 second pause and just be like, hey, before we jump in and share about our opinion on the conflict over here or the war over here or a parenting strategy over here or our finances, it's like, is this in line with the kingdom of God? Because it's in this kingdom where Christ is king where we find values and mindsets to engage with situations like Christ would have. So, we're talking about the kingdom. Now to do that, to talk about the kingdom, I want to rewind about 600 years BC to one of my favourite characters, Daniel, and his encounter with a powerful and slightly crazy king. Uh, this guy is called King Nebuchadnezzar. Not the statue, but we'll get to that in a moment. But King Nebuchadnezzar reigned for about 40 years as a world superpower. He was known as a builder and a constructor of great cities and aqueducts and so on, and unmatched military might. In two years into his reign, he had this significant and perplexing dream, and he wants to know its meaning. Now, he won't tell anyone what the dream is, but he will kill everybody if they don't tell him both the dream and, interp and the interpretation, right? It kind of sounds like this guy also needs a 90 second pause poster. And you can kind of imagine Daniel in the background, like passive aggressively pinning up this poster in King Nebuchadnezzar's kitchen, just like, just chill man, 90 seconds is all you need. Right? Don't kill everyone just yet. But Daniel is called to be a man of peace in this situation, to bring about clarity, and to bring really to demonstrate the kingdom. So we're going to read a bit of uh, Daniel chapter 2, and then I'm going to draw out some things to encourage us. Sound good? All right, cool. Now, it's a slightly abridged version, so follow along. Your majesty looked, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling, awesome in appearance. Some translations say terrifying in appearance. The head was gold, its chest and arms silver, its belly and thighs bronze, legs of iron and feet, iron and clay. While you watched, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. That would be my boy Toby's favourite part uh, of the story. Then the iron, the clay, bronze, silver and gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. At this point, I'll be opening my eyes to check if the, if the king's nodding along or not, if I'm getting it right. Right, a bit of a risky prophetic word to share. This was the dream, and now we will interpret it to the king. Your majesty, you are the king of kings. You are the head of, that, or head of gold. After you, another kingdom will arise, inferior to yours. Then a third of bronze will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron. And this is the passage we're going to camp on. And then, in the time of those kings... God of the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. And then there's high fives all round. He gets an awesome promotion and a pay rise, and the story, the story carries on. But we'll, we'll stay there. 
So what I want to do is focus on this passage. I want to highlight just two traits, just two things. Two traits of God's kingdom that will help us when we take those 90-second checks. Just two, two traits that will help us ask ourselves, well, are my thoughts, are my actions aligning with the kingdom of, of God? Because remember, which I encounter this a lot as well, his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And so often what he guides me in is counterintuitive and opposite to our reaction. But in the wise words of the Mandalorians, this is the way. <laughs> this is the way. Okay, so the first thing I want to bring out is that the kingdom is otherly. I don't know how else to put it. It's just, it's just different. Or as Jesus says to Pontius Pilate, it's not of this world. It's just so completely different. Let's compare, let's start by looking at the statue. What does the statue represent? The glory and wisdom of mankind and its pomp, separate to God. The results of man ruling and reigning without God. And the results are both equally dazzling, but also terrifying, as each kingdom works out how to destroy the next kingdom with greater efficiency. Proverbs says that there is a way, we might paraphrase, paraphrase that for our purposes as a rule or a kingdom, that seems right to man, but in the end it leads in death. That's not a bad summary of the wisdom and rule of man. Look at the statue. It starts off with a gold head, and as it progresses, it gets, the metals get stronger and more ability to crush others but also the metals become less valuable. It's a degrading. Actually, what is progression sometimes to man is actually a regression in God's eyes. You know what I mean? As humanity progresses, we more and more dehumanize the image of God that God created us to be. And so in this image, this represents everything that man can sum, sum, you know, sum up to. But then we have this small rock. This small rock is cut out. It's this, it's this foreign object. It's, a, it's of a different substance. It's, it's from another place. The closest thing I can uh, imagine it to is, is vibranium. Vi sorry, vibranium in the Black Panther series. A great movie is just shouting out to that. But in these movies, like this meteorite crashes to Earth with this other metal called vibranium. And it's just so completely different. It just revolutionizes life for those in Wakanda. Yeah? All the, yeah, movie fans, shout out. It revolutionizes the way they do energy, the way they do warfare, the technology, just everything. It's kind of like that different. It's just, it's just other. And so the first thing I would say is, when it's time to take those pauses and reflect, we ask ourselves, hmm, is this God's wisdom on display? Or is this other? Or is this, is this my own wisdom? Is this the fear of man? Is this the dazzling statue? I think we need to ask ourselves. And one easy example is how we budget and how we spend our money. Now, I don't know about your kids, but when my kids get a hold of a dollar coin, it's like their eyes light up like they're some kind of you know, bounty hunting pirate, and they're like, oh, I got me a dollar, you know? <laughs> And it's like, whoa, and I'm like, hey, you want to get, you want to get more of that? You want to be blessed to have, to have, you know, more and give more to others? Yeah, yeah, how do I do that? You know, and my kid's like, I'll give it away. Yeah, give it away, give it to someone else who needs it. Well, what do you mean? It's like, yeah, yeah, that is the otherly nature of the kingdom. Very relevant when our budgets are being pressured at the moment. You know, do we decrease our giving to cover the bills? Or do we increase our giving as a principle of the kingdom? Terrifying thought for you. Well, let's say another situ situation pops up this week. Perhaps you are wronged and offended this week. How are you to respond to that? And in these situations, usually we have no, no, we're not complicit in any way. We're just purely wronged by someone else. We've done nothing wrong to deserve it. It's just, we're just genuinely wronged. How are we to respond to that this week? Now, I know how I would like to respond if I didn't have a 90 second pause you know, crushing and smashing and striking. 
But again, there is a way that seems right but leads to death, right? And then I have my breakfast and I pick up my, my Bible and I have my cup of tea and I, and I read these familiar passages and I, I flick to the Sermon on the Mount and I, where is it? Here we go. Uh, do not resist one who is evil. If someone slaps you, let them slap you again. I'm paraphrasing. If someone would sue you and take something from you, let them have twice that. If someone extorts you and wants you to go one mile or give you five dollars, give them twice that. You know, so give to the one who begs from you. Do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. I mean, like, that's familiar stuff, but it's hard-hitting. And if we literally apply it, it's very other, isn't it? It's very, very other. How often am I wanting to defend my own honor as opposed to what Jesus says in the Sermon of the Mount? But hey, that's what he wants us to do. Like, really? Do I really have to do that? Yes. Yeah, that is the way. This is the way. Just as a bit of inspiration, I'm listening to a podcast um, just this week. Um, can really uh, recommend it. Uh, a history podcast, actually, about Te Rauparaha and fascinating character. Um, but what really jumped out to me about this podcast was his son, Tamihana. I don't know if you, if, if you guys have heard of Tamihana Te Rauparaha, but he was a fascinating character as well. And, and um, as a boy, Tamihana would have accompanied his father on expeditions of war to, uh, you know, into battles with, with Te Rauparaha's enemies, and he would have seen firsthand warfare. He would have been a bit like David, you know, comfortable with a, with a, um, a weapon in hand, ready to, ready to strike at his enemies. But this young boy, Tamihana, after seeing that as a child, later in his life was so profoundly impacted by his Christian faith, he went to his enemies, but not for Utu, but actually to share about the gospel of peace. And it was at great cost to himself. He went to places like the South, uh, went to places like the South Island to uh, Naitahu, for example, and shared the gospel of peace there. I mean, it's just such a radical idea that this, this, this young boy, he would have been comfortable in battle and said, no, I'm gonna be a man of peace. I'm gonna go to enemies at great cost to myself and risk my life to, sh to share the kingdom. And to this day in the South Island, Tamihana Te Rauparaha is, as I understand it, uh, understood, uh, remembered as a man of peace, which is a far different legacy in some parts of the South Island than his father. And, uh, and so I just find that fascinating. Here is someone I can take inspiration from in our own backyard who was caught up in an otherly kingdom, who would have taken the time to say, hey, what's my approach gonna be? Am I gonna you know, polish the feet of this dazzling statue, or am I going to approach this in an otherly way, in obedience to Christ? So, that's the first thing. The second thing, I'm aware of time, so I'll keep moving. Second and last thing is that the kingdom is an, it's an opposing, confronting, subversive kingdom. To subvert means to undermine the power and authority of an existing system. To subvert. Now, in Jesus' day, the expectation of a coming kingdom was a very, had a very militant aspect to it. You know, they, were, they, they literally thought that the kingdom of God would arrive and strike and crush other kingdoms. Maybe because passages like this talked about the kingdom of God arriving and striking and crushing other kingdoms. You know, at, at face value, it seems to be what is happening. Even in some parts of the New Testament, it starts to sound like that, doesn't it? Paul writes, sorry, jumping around a bit here. Paul writes that Christ, having disarmed the powers and authorities, made a public spectacle of his enemies triumphing over them. Hmm, interesting. How did he do that? How did he strike and crush them? Then Paul drops the bombshell by the cross. By the cross. You see, the subversive nature of the kingdom was the cross, it was weakness. Shame, suffering, failure, and death. That is the upside-down nature of the kingdom. Yes, it will come and crush, but it will do so in completely unexpected means. Let's unpack this a bit further. The Apostle Paul, who wrote this, carried the gospel to Rome and proclaimed the gospel right under the nose of the very king who Daniel prophesied about 
in that, in that prophecy in Daniel. And he said, hey, Caesar, you're not king, you're not Lord. Jesus is. Whoa, clash of the kingdoms. That sounds like, you know, a real battle. What's the battle plan, Paul? Says those in, in Rome. What shall we do? Well, Paul says, okay, here's the battle plan. Embrace suffering. Bless those who persecute you. Never avenge yourself. Overcome evil with good. Be subject to governing authorities. <laughs> what? <laughs> Love your neighbour. Bear with the failings of the weak. It's counterintuitive. It's, it's the kingdom. And you see, the thing is, with this message and with this way, Christianity grew and triumphed over that tyrannical empire. And Daniel's prophecy was fulfilled. We are called to walk in opposition. We are called to be subversive. We are called to be confronting, but in the ways of the kingdom, in a very otherly way. So in our 90-second pauses, we can ask ourselves, what aspect of this kingdom, this otherly kingdom, is needed to be at work today in my life to disarm the works of the enemy, to disarm worldly powers, to, to shift and change things? I want to give you a fun example uh, of how this might look like. One of my favorite books to read my kids is Enemy Pie. Anyone heard, seen this one before? Enemy Pie. You can, Google, you can search it on YouTube and you can watch it. But this is a great book, Enemy Pie. So this young boy, maybe we should bring the kids in at this point. It's almost time. Uh, so this, this boy here, he goes to school and he finds himself with an enemy. This little boy, he has an enemy. And uh, he doesn't like him and the other boy doesn't like him either. And so he goes home and he goes, Dad, I've got an enemy at school now. And Dad goes, Excellent. I've got just the thing, a secret recipe just for enemies, enemy pie. And uh, we're going to feed it to your enemy. And this boy's like, starts to scheme about all the things he could put into this pie. Maybe we're going to put snails and bugs. Maybe we're going to, you know, poison this guy or whatever. I'm going to get rid of, there he goes, just the thing to get rid of your enemy. Now the thing is, you need to invite your friend over because how else are we going to feed, your enemy, sorry, because how else is he going to eat this enemy pie? And so the boy oh, reluctantly invites this boy over and pretends to be his friend for a while. And dad's in the kitchen cooking up enemy pie. And then the time comes. This boy is watching as his dad cuts a slice. And he watches enemy take a bite. And he can't wait to see the look on his face. And the boy's face lights up. And it's the best pie he's ever tasted. And he starts to realize something. He realizes, ah. Oh, Actually, my loving and wise dad doesn't want me to deal with my enemies, but in a very different way. He wants me to make a friend out of my enemy. He wants me to feed my enemy. He wants me to do it in a very different way. My heart kind of jumped a beat when I read that, because I was like, this is almost the same heart as the loving Heavenly Father who wants us as his kids to be subversive, but in a very different way, to approach things of the kingdom in a very different way. And the book ends sweetly with the boy now with a new friend. And you just like think, man, that's the heart of God right there, isn't it? That's the heart of the kingdom. Enemy pie. It's good. Anyway, you give lots of illustrations. That's a bit of a fun one. So, just to wrap up, because time has gone. There are many situations that we, like Daniel, are called to be engaged with, with the wisdom of the kingdom of God. This kingdom is otherly, it's opposing, and because of that, we just need time to pause and reflect sometimes. We need to take time for that renewed thinking to be reflected in our actions and in our responses. Jesus teaches us to pray, let your kingdom come on earth as in heaven. Let that rock build and grow and take influence around us. But here's the thing, it's through Christ's body that that kingdom will grow and expand. We really are the answer to that prayer. I'll finish with a quote uh, by one of my favourite authors, N.T. Wright. He says, When people often say as they do, why doesn't God do something? They always seem to assume that if God was really in control, he'd send in the tanks, stop the bullies and unscrupulous getting away with it. 
But according to the Sermon on the Mount, when God wants to change the world, he doesn't send in the tanks. He sends in the meek and the mourners and the merciful and the justice-hungry people and the peacemakers and the pure in heart. This list always was a list of human characteristics through which God would bring his heaven on earth. That's you and me. That's who we're called to be. Shall we stand? Yeah, Lord Jesus, thank you that you are the wonderful counsellor. You are our divine counsellor. You come alongside us like that loving, wise father in that book, Enemy Pie, and you, you come alongside us and you show us the way. You show us a better way, Lord. Lord, I just pray for, at our end, make us willing. Help us to be courageous. Give us the strength to lay down our own life or our own pride or whatever it is that we need to lay down in order to let your kingdom come. And Lord, more and more we pray that your kingdom come, Lord, on earth as in heaven and in our lives. Amen. Amen.